settle for the longer way. Zwei Flaschen Whisky für die Zeit. Und ich date gern, aber du bist dabei. Mario geht, fuck mal weg, ist bei. Wann ich geh, wann ich geh. Ich werd die Fehler, wann ich geh. Du seh nicht mehr, was ich mach. Du seh nicht mehr, wie ich lach. Ich werd die Fehler, du watch sehen. Ich krieg mein Zettel für den langen Weg. Du schenkst da aus mir für den Kahn. Es hat Mario und Dale ganz wunderbar. Hass ich dir den weißen Dank. Wann ich geh, wann ich geh. Ich werd dir fehlen, wann ich geh. Du seh nicht mehr, was ich mach. Du seh nicht mehr, wie ich lach. Ich werd dir fehlen, du was ich seh. Well, 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 kuda over liebe Lion. The Doug is back at you. It feels like it has been forever since I've been with you guys. It has been since, boy, the beginning of June. Uh, because of some things that have been going on, we were at the beginning of June, and now we're at the end of July, and almost a well over a month has passed since we've been able to bring you a brand new episode. But we are back at it tonight with a brand new episode of PNH Live. We've got a great guest waiting in the wings. We'll be bringing her on here in a couple minutes. But in that meantime, since we have been gone, just a, you know, one of the reasons, or I'll give you two of the reasons that it took so long for us to get this show and it was so late in July. One, uh, my family and I, we took a well-deserved vacation for 10 days out to California in June. Had a wonderful time. Took our Pennsylvania Dutch pride out there to the West Coast. Did some hiking in some national parks and saw some really cool things. And then in July, for the better part of the beginning of July, we were knee deep at the Kutztown Folk Festival. So it's been a busy uh, summer so far, but we are back at it with you guys. If this is your first time joining us on PA Dutch Live, welcome, as we say in Pennsylvania Dutch, whether you're watching on the YouTube channel or on PA Dutch 101 at Facebook Welcome. If you are a regular viewer, welcome back. Welcome zurück, as we say in Pennsylvania Dutch. Please, in the comment section, no matter where you're watching, let me know where you are joining us from. I like to give shout outs to people at the beginning of every show. We have Kathy joining us. Good over von Elizabeth Town. We got Lancaster County represented right off the bat. We have Ethan Road. Good over aus Canada. We got our friendly neighbors to the north. Ethan, I'm hearing good things about your classes at the Berkeley. History Center. Keep up the great work. We have Dr. All Guda Ovid aus der Alen Hamet. So from across the ocean, Dr. All stayed awake over there in the old home in Europe somewhere. We have Norman. He joins us every month. Guda Maria aus dem Kuzla Musikantenland. Welcome, Norman. It's good to have you staying up with us again after midnight. Wonderful showing. Dolly joins us every month and she's back again from beautiful Fleetwood in Berks County, close to my heart. Higgins, PA, being represented. Thanks, James, for joining us tonight. We got Skoogl Condi now on the show. We have Nicole joining us from Lickdale. Where's Lickdale? I don't remember. If I heard before, I forgot. Jeff Schmitz joining us from Royersford, PA. We have, we're leaving Pennsylvania. Randy Howard is joining us from South Central Texas. Welcome, Randy. I bet you it's hot where you are. It's pretty hot where we are. I've seen those temps in Texas. It's pretty crazy down there right now. David, our good friend is joining us good evening joining from farmville virginia the great commonwealth of virginia great to have you david and we got brigitte joins us every month hello from philadelphia good to have you joining us brigitte as well michael is joining us from the state capitol there in harrisburg hey michael why don't you walk down to the capitol building tomorrow and get that uh get that uh, general assembly to pass a state budget for us please can you do a little strong arming there and and get this state back on track in that said hey gerno is joining us good home now Zweibrücken in the pulse he also staying up after midnight I've been to Zweibrücken. It's a beautiful place. Victoria Young is joining us from Phoenixville. There, I know where Phoenixville is. Nia Frey from Bayern. We got we got a lot of Europeans joining us tonight. That's wonderful. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Don joining us from Midlothian, Virginia. He joins us every month as well. Bio T. Hey, Doug, it's Todd out in Tucson. We've been emailing a couple times back and forth, Todd, about some stuff. Thank, I bet it's hot in Arizona, too. I, I really uh, I feel for you guys there in Texas and Arizona. I don't know how you're doing it, but uh, I guess you guys got to keep doing it, right? Our good friend Rachel is joining us. Jacob and I are watching for a few minutes while Matt's driving. Us to, <laughs> hey, I'm glad that you're joining us. You can't 
catch the catch the recording tomorrow, Rachel. Um, we have Randy 104 today. Randy, thanks. Whew, man, that's hot. Holy cow. Uh, Shiprider is joining us from Lansdale in Montgomery County. We're gonna be talking more about Montgomery County here in a little bit. And our good friend Scott is also say good to over house not Hampton County. My friend, good to see you, Scott. Missed you at the folk festival. I know we'll get you soon next time, though. That's for sure. Oh my gosh, the Bell Snickles joining us. <laughs> well, somebody named the Bell Snickle from Dumfries, Virginia. Boy, we got people all all over the place joining us. That is so wonderful to have you guys. And um, I think you're in for a really good show, but let's talk a little about the show in a little bit. I'm going to be welcoming on our special guest, Carly Schmidt. I'll talk more about her in a couple minutes, but I do have our normal beginning of the episode, some news and events to mark your calendars. There's a lot of stuff coming up here in the next couple months in the greater Pennsylvania Dutch region of things that you can check out, starting with the Gosh and Hoppen historians, 55th annual folk festival. This is a really great event. So if you can make it, it's Friday and Saturday, August 11th and 12th at the Harry Annis Plantation there in Perky Omenville in Montgomery County. Please, if you get a chance, go check that out. It is a wonderful uh, event. You can learn more about that event on their uh, Facebook page and also on their website. So check out the Gosh and Hoppins. They do a really, really good job. There's another Pennsylvania German Farm Festival taking place at the historic Dreibelbiss Farm, which is in beautiful Berks County, uh, right outside of Virginville, not too far from Virginville. On Saturday, August 26th, free admission. You do have to pay to park, but no big deal. Three bucks. There's tons of music. There's going to be guest speakers, lots of food and drinks available. It's going to be a really nice Pennsylvania German, Pennsylvania Dutch day. Get out there to the Dreibelbiss Farm. They do really great stuff, too. I'm hoping I can get one of their uh, reps as a guest on the show in the future. I'd love to to have them tell the Dreibelbiss story. Also, uh, the annual Haymet Fesh at the Pennsylvania German Cultural Heritage Center at Kutztown University will be taking place September 23rd. Mark your calendars from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. That is a free event, free entrance, free parking, lots of educational uh, things going on there. There'll be performers doing music. There'll be live uh, cooking demonstrations as well. It is a really great event. Mark your calendars for that event too. And we're going to go a little bit farther outside the PA Dutch realm here out to York County. If you are in the greater York County area and you'd like to hear me uh, or see me live, uh, I was invited to this last year. It was a wonderful event. Uh, the um, St. Jacob's Church. Um, I don't remember the full name. I think it's St. Jacob's Stone Church. It's a UCC church in Glenville, Pennsylvania, which is in Southern York County. Every year they do a Pennsylvania Dutch worship service followed by a luncheon. Of course, it's all free. Um, regular church service starts at 1015. Uh, we'll be doing a mix of English and Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, we'll be singing some hymns in Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, and then, but you want to stay for the luncheon afterwards. It is traditional Pennsylvania Dutch stuff. Pig stomach with coleslaw, pepper slaw, applesauce, dessert strings, more food than you can shake a stick at. All homemade wonderful, wonderful, good stuff. And while we're saying mark your calendars, and I talked already about this, the Christoph Folk Festival has come and gone. It was a success once again. Lots of people were there. It was the weather was typical Kutztown Folk Festival weather, hot, humid, but everybody that was there seemed to have a great time. Mark your calendars for next year. June 29th through July 7th, 2024 will be next year's uh, Kutztown Folk Festival. You can get that on your calendar, of course. Uh, God willing, I'll be there performing again. And if you are a fan of the YouTube channel or you subscribe, please watch over the next coming weeks. I took a lot of footage at the Folk Festival this year, did a lot of like interviews of random people in the street. It was a lot of fun material coming out. So I'll be dropping a couple. I think I've made four or five total videos out of that material. And I'll be dropping them from week to week. So check back to see if you missed this year's folk festival you can see some of the stuff that went on at this week's at this year's folk festival real quick to a couple other people that are joining us ryan rainer metz field cruise house altrip so altrip is a city in germany they are also the partner city to Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And uh, some members from Altrip were in Kutztown this summer at the Folk Festival. And I know that in the very near future, the mayor of Kutztown, Jim Schlegel, and some other people from Kutztown are going to be traveling to Altrip to renew and, and maintain this, this partnership city status. Great story. I'm glad that that kind of stuff is happening. Jeff Mark says, I'm the guy who lives near that long-bearded musician. <laughs> 
Appetizer. Yes, they're in Mont Etna. Jeff, thanks for joining us. It's good to see you, my friend. And Luann joins us from Manchester, Maryland. So if you're joining us, of course, let us know where you're joining us from. So that's all the news that I have for you. Every month here for the last couple of months, I've been doing a hee-haw style salute to a town somewhere in Pennsylvania Dutch country. And this month, we give a loud salute to Lansdale in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. According to what I could find, it was founded as a town or borough status in 1872, and their current population is somewhere around 18,773. So a big salute to Lansdale, Montgomery County, Pennsylvania. It is time to move into the portion of the show that most of you are probably here for. I would like to welcome on uh, our special guest this month is Carly Schmidt. She is the museum educator at the Peter Wentz Farmstead. And if you don't know anything about the Peter Wentz Farmstead, well, you're going to learn all about it here in a couple minutes. So without further ado, let me bring in Carly. Hello, Carly. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad that you agreed to come on. So yeah. I start every month uh, whenever the guest comes on, I ask them this question. Are you Pennsylvania Dutch? I am not. Um, which With is... a good last name like Schmidt? Yes. <laughs> so uh, I am German by way of Wisconsin. Uh, my dad's oh, okay. family uh, was from Wisconsin. So um, not actually Pennsylvania Dutch, but still, you know, in the in the same family. The same vein. Yeah, I guess we yeah. could say. Well, what brought you from the Midwest to southeastern Pennsylvania? That I don't know. Um, okay. My dad is in the chat, so if he knows, oh, okay. he will be able to answer. Um, <laughs> okay. But uh, his dad, I know, was involved, was in the military, so possibly something to do with that. Oh, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I know because his dad was from Wisconsin, and then his mom was from New York, so no, none of them were, what? you know, native to the area. But now you find yourself smack dab in the middle of, of Pennsylvania Dutch country. So yes, that's good. I'm absolutely. glad that you're here. I'm so glad you enjoyed to come on the show and uh, tell us all about uh, your job. And of course, what you can what we can learn from the Peter Wentz Farmstead. I guess a great place to start is what is this? Uh, what is the Peter Wentz Farmstead? OK, yeah. So the Peter Wentz Farmstead, we are a historic house museum and working farm in Montgomery County. We're one of five county owned and operated historic sites, um, four of which are open to the public. Um, and one of them is us. Um, we are, basically we interpret the house um, around the 1770s uh, era. Um, I don't talk about why as, I, as we go through today, but um, that's when the Wentz family lived here. Um, they acquire the property in 1744. The house is built 1758. So when you go through the house, you see um, it's all set up basically to look as it would have looked when the Wences lived here. Okay. Well, I'm in control of the slides here, I think. So you just let me know when you want me to advance and mm -hmm. I'll just turn the show over to you. You can tell us your story. All right. Great. Yeah. I think I am possibly are you to able to slides. okay that's great yeah all right yeah um yes so yeah thank you for uh for having me again um we you know our site is very much steeped in that uh pennsylvania dutch pennsylvania german culture um so i'm very excited to be able to share that with you guys tonight um so our story starts uh all the way back in germany in the 18th century um during, in 1709, there was what they called the Palatine Migration, um, where roughly 30,000 Germans immigrated to, or, or migrated to London. Um, it was kind of their middle stop on, they were, the plan was they all wanted to get to the New World, um, but they have to stop in London first uh, on their way there. Um, they end up having to stay for quite a while. And although, you know, starts out, they have a pretty good reception and the uh, people in England are trying to be, you know, kind and helpful to them. But the longer they stay there, they start to kind of wear out their welcome. Um, so a lot of them return home. Uh, a lot of them seek refuge elsewhere in Europe. 
but about 3,000 of them make it all the way over to the New World. And one of those people uh, was Peter Wentz Sr. Um, so he, uh, you know, when he arrives here, he's first, we believe, first lands in New York and then kind of makes his way down to Pennsylvania. Um, he is born in 1682, uh, and I'm <laughs> a little uh, nervous to have so many actual German people in the chat because I promise <laughs> you I will not pronounce any of these words right. Uh, I'll help you out, Carly. Okay. I'll help you out. <laughs> uh, so he's born in Gersheim near Worms uh, in the Palatinate region of what is now Germany. Mm -hmm. um, we don't really know anything about his early life, but we do know that he's recorded in the London census in 1709 so that he's part of that big migration. Um, while he's in London, he meets and marries an Elisabetta Rupert or Ruperti, um, who is also from the Pal Palatinate in a town called Epstein near Neustadt an der Hart. Um, <laughs> and they get married at the Church of St. Mary Le Savoy on June 5th of 1709. And that's the picture up at the top there is that church. Um, so at some point after that, they end up traveling to the American colonies um, and show up in Pennsylvania land records as living in Germantown as early as 1711, um, then later moving to what's now Montgomery County. Um, according to census records, Peter Sr. is usually listed as a farmer, um, but really today we would call what he did, basically he was in real estate. Um, he mostly made most of his money buying and selling and leasing land, um, and by 1743 owns about a thousand acres of land in Worcester Township. So a lot, uh, <laughs> he's, he did well for himself. Um, so then Peter Wentz Jr., uh, who is our Peter, was born in Worcester Township um, in 1719. He's the third of Peter Sr. and Elizabeth's uh, surviving children. Um, and he, in about 1741, marries Rosanna Margareta Gemellen. Um, and they would go on to have seven children together and live basically their whole lives in the Worcester area. Um, so now towards the end of Peter Sr.'s life, he starts to kind of parcel out that thousand acres to his sons, and Peter Jr. receives about 300 acres um, of land and starts to establish his homestead here in 1744. Um, so living here would have been him and his wife, um, not all of their children. Some of them were grown by the time this house is built, um, but they also had some of their grandchildren living here at certain points. Um, hired help would also live on the property, as well as uh, several indentured servants over the years and at least two enslaved Black men. Um, so eventually they do decide to kind of downsize and move to a smaller home in Whitpain Township, uh, selling it to a guy named DeVault Bieber, and who he holds on to the property for about 10 years um, until 1794 when it's sold to Reverend Melchior Schultz and his wife Salome. Um, Schultz is a, was a Schwenkfelder reverend. So um, that's one of the many, you know, with Pennsylvania Dutch folks, there are a lot of kind of these small little uh, insular sects of Christianity. So that's one of those that's really big in our area, um, even today. Um, then for the next 175 years, the Schultz family lives in this house. Um, five generations, uh, I think, live there until it's sold to the county in 1969. So why does the county choose this particular house uh, to turn into a historic site. You know, Peter Wentz, he's not a famous person. Um, he's not, you know, somebody who did anything of note, really. He's kind of just your average, you know, upper middle class farmer. Um, what really kind of 
catches people's eye most of the time when they they come to the site is very short period of time in October of 1777 when General George Washington used the Wentz House as his headquarters. Um, he's there twice. Uh, first time he's there, October 2nd to the 3rd. Short little visit, but it's a significant one because the next day was the Battle of Germantown. Um, so obviously he must have done at least some of the planning or prep work while he was here. Um, essentially, they marched from you know, Worcester, Lansdale area, all the way to Germantown in Philadelphia. They fight the battle, they lose, and have to immediately march all the way back to Schwenksville to our sister site, Penny Packer Mills, um, where they stay for a little while. Um, once they've kind of regrouped over the next couple of weeks, they make their way back down Skipback Pike and end up back at the Wentz house October 16th through the 20th. Um, give you an idea of kind of where we are in the war for people who aren't necessarily big war buffs. Uh, this would be two months before they end up in Valley Forge. Um, so although it's a pretty short visit, it's really only six total days that he was here. Uh, his presence, Washington's presence at the farmstead is really why we exist as a museum. Um, do, 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 family, record, do we do you guys know why out of all of the places Washington chose this specific house was he invited by the Wences or did he just say that's a nice big house that's where I'm gonna go or I mean uh, maybe yeah, the, so, do, do we know why yeah so he had a guy who uh can't remember his exact title but one of his kind of aides was a guy named um Caleb Gibbs and part of his job was to be scouting out houses for him to stay out. So he would kind of, you know, as the troops are marching along, he'd be kind of going ahead, trying to find places that were willing to host them, that were large enough to host all of them at wow. the same time. Um, and it's a good strategic place because it's, you know, it's close enough to Philadelphia that you can get there in a day, but it's far enough away that, you know, the British are probably not going to be bothering to head all the way out there. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, you know, the Wences probably wouldn't have necessarily invited them, but um, he would have gotten permission. He always made sure that was a big sticking point during the revolution, um, quartering. Um, it's actually was such a problem that they put, you know, it's in the Constitution, um, right, right. So, you know, he always made a point to ask permission to stay places and he always paid room and board. Um, we actually in the Library of Congress, there is a receipt um, and you can see kind of the middle picture there where there's that document on the table. That's a copy of it. Um, it's written by Peter's son, Matthias, and it lists everything that Washington consumed while he was there, all the food and the drink. I think it even includes like two broken glass bowls. Um, and that was their kind of receipt for the room and board. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, as far as I've ever seen, that is the only written document that exists by one of the immediate members of the Wentz family. Um, and the only reason it exists is because it was sent to Congress and it's part of the Washington and uh, government papers. So it's put in the Library of Congress. Um, it's very similar to a lot of the story here. You know, um, the top left picture is the Washington room. Um, all of the families who lived here after the Wences knew that that was the room he had slept in. So it kind of became, you know, like anybody, if you had a room in your house that George Washington had slept in, you wouldn't really want to touch it much. So um, I think it went through maybe two coats of paint and one coat of wallpaper in the 175 years that the Schultzes lived there. So that room was, you know, it's pretty, it's our most accurate, most exact room in the house. Um, and the site in general, you know, because Washington stayed here, that's why we were made a historic site. Um, you know, in the early or in the late 60s, the county started to kind of prepare for the bicentennial. 
And their idea was to buy up a few historic houses that had some connection to Washington or the revolution um, and have them open for the bicentennial. Um, so, you know, all these things, like they are only written document by a member of the family. The, you know, most accurate room in the house, the whole house in general, even though Washington's only here for six days, that's why all these things were able to be preserved. So, um, you know, it's a very small part of the story, but it's the part of the story that allows us to tell the rest of the story. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the property itself, um, the first structure built here would have been the barn. Um, our current barn that you see here is a reconstruction uh, based on a typical Pennsylvania German bank barn of the time, um, but it is built on the location of Peter's original barn. Um, and, you know, obviously the property's occupied all the way up till the 60s. Um, a lot of changes had been made over the years to kind of modernize it and keep it functional. So the original barn had been replaced uh, several times over, um, but parts of the foundation survived. And so the uh, brick that you see there in the bottom left, that is a date stone that's got, mm -hmm. it says 17 PW 44. So that's how we know when the barn was built, 1744. Um, the house, however, is built, isn't completed until 1758. Um, and you can kind of see why it's a rather large home for yeah, this time period. Um, it had it's two stories tall. It has an attic and a cellar and an out kitchen. Um, there's five bed chambers, which is a lot for a family that you know wasn't that big comparatively to a lot of families at the time. Um, you know, nowadays people look at this house and they're not totally impressed by it like if you compared this to you know some of the uh you know, mansions in philadelphia of this time period it's much plainer but if you think about this being you know it was all farmland around here it was pretty much desolate just you know farmland no you know, very few homes and the homes that were there were very far apart so um this would have been a mansion this would have been a, yeah. a really impressive home for that uh for the time period and for the area um it's really kind of a uniquely american structure because it's this combination of german architectural and design but also it's got an english style georgian style layout um so you know peter he's born in America. So he's not as, you know, he's kind of one step removed from that, you know, German culture. So this is kind of, you're kind of seeing those early begin, you know, the beginnings of that like melting pot idea where you're starting to combine cultures and uh, that sort of thing. Um, so what I'm talking about most here is going to be the structure of the house because that's what's really original here um the objects inside the house that are part of our collection are from the time period but didn't belong to the wentz family um so you know i want to show off some of the particularly german elements of the okay. house uh, that would have been here when the wentz's lived here uh, so we've got the exterior of the house it is built with locally quarried redstone uh, we don't know exactly where it was quarried from, but it had to have been somewhere nearby because it would have taken a lot of work to get it over here. Um, then you've got, oops, pretty big. Uh, we've got our pent roof um, going all the way around. Um, that would have been a pretty common German feature, as well as would be the Dutch doors. All of the exterior doors of the house are Dutch doors. Um, so they open, you know, the top half open separately from the bottom half so that you, know, you can get light and air going in through the hallways. 
while also keeping out, you know, people didn't fence in animals back then. They fenced them out of things. So, you know, your pigs would be, could be wandering through the hall or things like that. So that's where you've got that kind of, um, you know, the Dutch door to handle that issue. Um, then be on the back side of the house, probably our most obviously German uh, piece of the house is the house Siegen uh, or the house blessing. Um, so you can see there it is kind of, uh, this is a piece of stone. It's about a square, sort of a square sized piece of stone um, you know, placed directly into the stonework of the house um, right on our summer kitchen there. Um, and it has a blessing on it written in German. Um, it's got the initials PW and RW for Peter and Rosanna Wentz. And then roughly translated to English, this would say, Jesus, come into my house, never to leave again. Come with thy blessed favor and bring peace to my soul. Um, obviously, you know, with most, if not all, German immigrants in uh, Pennsylvania at that time, a lot of them came here because they were facing some degree of religious persecution back home. Um, and so, you know, Pennsylvania attracted Germans specifically because it was touted as this place where people of all religions could, you know, live together uh, peacefully. So, you know, being able to, uh, the Wences were uh, reformed Lutherans. Um, so they were, you know, anybody Protestant at that time was dealing with uh, a lot of uh, prejudice and persecution back in Germany. Um, but you have to imagine that, you know, being able to, you know, being in this uh, community that's very, you know, open to all religions, you know, being able to kind of put your, you know, a, such a permanent sign of your beliefs right into the wall of your house, um, you know, it's powerful, has, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Kind of, finally, they have this freedom to express themselves in a way they yeah. might not have back home. Um, then inside the house, uh, both of the floors kind of follow this symmetry of the typical English Georgian floor plan, uh, which is the bisected hallway with two rooms on either side. Um, you're... German homes typically are, uh, you have kind of, uh, it's all based around a central uh, fireplace or stove. So, you know, that's where this kind of uh, combination of styles starts to come in. Um, but the Wentz is, they create this kind of, you know, they've got this Georgian symmetry, but they do still keep the feel of that central stove by having one on each side of the house. Um, so when I'm saying, talking about a stove, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, something to cook with. This is, um, more of, it's like a heat, uh, a heating stove. Um, so this is a jam stove. It's five plate cast iron stove. Um, that is, it's box shaped. One panel at the back is open and it's jutting up against the wall. Behind that wall is the hearth in the kitchen. So the kitchen hearth is always going, you know, it's always hot. Um, the, you're never actually building a fire in the stove. That hole between the two of them, uh, the heat from the kitchen fire is going to heat up the plates of the stove like a radiator. So it cuts down, you know, if you had a fireplace in here, you'd have to be using twice the amount of firewood. So it's kind of, it's a fuel efficient way of doing things. Um, these were relatively common for kind of your upper class German homes. Um, the ones that we have here, um, one of the neat things about the families, you know, the Schultzes and the other, and who lived after the Wentzes is when they made changes to the house, they often 
would reuse other pieces of the house. So there would be, you know, a piece of molding from the parlor that's being used as chair rail upstairs or things like that. Um, with the stove, one of the plates of the stove was found being used as window well cover in the basement. Uh, one was being used as a hearth in a later smokehouse. So they were able to find those and create, recreate it based on the exact uh, original oh, that's really cool. design. Um, and I figured I'd blow this up a little bit more because we've got more German text, which that I do not have a translation for. But I know that uh, the scene is the temptation of Joseph. Um, if any of you are all you know, familiar with the Mercer Museum uh, in Doylestown, Henry Mercer was uh, kind of the expert on these stoves. Um, he wrote a book called The Bible in Iron. A lot of the times these stoves had biblical scenes on them. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, I would recommend checking that out. Um, then go into the probably most remarked upon feature of the house and our most uh, unique feature of the house uh, is the paint decoration. Mm -hmm. um, so these elaborate decorations that you see here are pretty much, they're in all but one room of the house has some kind of patterning on it. The first floor is all polka dots. Um, then when you get upstairs, it's a little bit more complex with these kind of like diamonds and half swirls and things like that. Um, mostly all uh, kind of a, there's a black, white, and this sort of burgundy red. Um, and then the downstairs, you've got the mustard yellow on the molding. And upstairs, you've got the sort of Prussian blue molding. Um, we, this was not something that was common back then um that's you know long kind of confounded visitors and researchers alike um you can see here uh on the left this is the paint from the washington room so on the left you can see the original paint and then on the right is the uh restored version of the paint um so when during the restoration of the property in 1974 they had a conservator come in named frank welsh um, who was basically just hired to kind of strip back all the layers of wallpaper and paint uh, over the years and just figure out what color the walls had been. And instead he finds all of these crazy patterns and he's able to date them to between 1758 and 1770. Um, so we know that this is what the walls looked like. Um, there was discussion back in the day of whether they should actually recreate them because it is so unusual and it it does seem so kind of weird to modern eyes um but you know obviously it's a part of the history of the house so they did yeah. replicate the patterns um and we have a few places like this throughout the house where uh they put plexiglass over the original sec pa paint so that you can still kind of see that evidence there I'm glad the decision was made to do that so that, I mean, yes, this is what the walls would have looked like when the Wences would have lived there. And it is so unique, especially to this part of, I mean, it's, it's unique to the Pennsylvania Dutch, I think, for one aspect, but also for the United States. I mean, you're not going to find this type of, of of paint color and schemes like this in New yes. England, for example, or down south either. I, I'm, I'm whoever made that decision back in the 70s. Yes. I'm glad that they, <laughs> yeah, made, we're the very lucky. That they made. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it is kind of an odd thing where you know and this is a, a picture here of frank welsh doing that uh, recreating the patterns and you can see again some of that original paint with the restoration around it um you know normally this is where i would talk to you about kind of our theories on why the house is painted like this but we've just within the past like month or two have been getting brand new information um mm -hmm. about it for the first time in you know the almost 50 years that we, we've existed um where you know for since the site opened 
it's been pretty much believed that this is the only house that looked like this um, at that time period. But we're starting to kind of find more evidence that other homes had similar, like the polka dot decorations. The thing, though, that kind of makes us stand out is those houses, it's usually either, it's usually just one room or maybe even just a wall. Whereas this house, it's every single room. Um, for both kitchens, it's floor to ceiling dots. Um, so, you know, the Wentz is, if this was something that was being done, at least somewhat commonly, you know, the Wentz is obviously did it to a much larger degree um well i would i would think given the cost of paint in that yes. time period this might have been also a way of of somehow showing their showing what showing some wealth off too exactly. um yeah. i mean that's just i mean i've talked to other people that have we had a guest on uh last year that specializes in colonial era pennsylvania dutch houses and farmhouses okay. and she was talking about paint and paint colors and and how much some of these paint colors would cost and if you had blue yeah. that was really expensive mm -hmm. and you know so i went when you showed some of these pictures right off the bat i was thinking back to some of the comments that she had made um so i, I mean yeah i would think some of it had to be that i mean to have exactly. this kind of house you know yeah so it is interesting though because they you know Definitely, it would have been a major sign of wealth because, again, like not only to have this many different colors and patterns, but to have so much of it throughout the yeah. house, you probably have to have multiple people in there painting it for you. It'd probably take a long time. Um, but the interesting thing about it is that it's not just in the rooms that guests would see. It's throughout the house, even in yeah. the kitchens where theoretically nobody important is ever going to see what's in the kitchen. So, you know, it's interesting that they would make the effort to do it throughout the house when there are places where it's never really going to be seen by anybody but the family. Right, um, right. So, yeah, there's a lot of kind of, you know, I'm, I feel like probably it was done for a lot of different reasons. Um, sometimes I kind of imagine like a itinerant artist that's, going from town to town saying, Hey, I can paint polka dots on your walls. And you know, the, Somebody with a, you know, like the, the music man who's uh, particularly convincing, um, yeah, right. got them to do the entire house with them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's something too that, you know, we've also had theories that it's got at least some basis in kind of traditional Pennsylvania Dutch uh, folk art and decorative mm -hmm. arts because you do see so much color and patterning in, you know, like the furniture and all of that kind of thing. Um, so possibly that's an inspiration mm -hmm. for it, but definitely not something that your average person would have had <laughs> on their right. walls for sure. Right. Um, so now that you know what we are, who we are, I had just wanted to give you kind of a quick idea of some of the things that we do. Um, so we are open for guided tours Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4 and on Sundays from 1 to 4. Um, you can give us a call or you can even just show up and we'll be here to, to give you a tour. We're also not just a house museum we're a working farm um currently we have two cows four uh lambs and a whole bunch of chickens um and we do all kinds of demonstrations with all of them our cows uh peg and sam their sisters and have been trained since they were about six weeks old i believe on a yoke and can now pull carts and things around the farm mm. um so that's fun um and then we offer a variety of events throughout the year, focusing primarily on farm life in the 18th century, um, including living history demonstrations, kids activities, workshops. Um, we were talking just before this that, uh, you know, we, I've just got finished two weeks ago with our annual summer camp. Um, every year we do a colonial camp in the summer. It's a week long thing where kids come and they do all kinds of really cool, you know, traditional colonial crafts. 
This year they learned how to weave on a tape loom. Um, they uh, got to see, you know, talk to a Lenape gentleman about Lenape history and culture of the area. Um, we did, you know, we even did a thing where they went into the creek and checked out some of the critter, the critters who live in there. Like they caught, I think one of the groups caught like 11 crayfish or something like that. <laughs> uh, so it really kind of spans uh, all kinds of things. Um, uh, last year, especially, we did a lot of Pennsylvania German art. Um, we did fractor painting, we did hex signs, and we did Sharon Schnitta. Um, yeah, yeah. So lots of that kind of stuff uh, that we do. Um, then every spring we do our sheep shearing event. It's one of our biggest events of the year um, where it's all about, you know, springtime on the farm and textile making. And of course you get to watch the sheep get shorn. Um, and then December, first weekend of December, we always do our candlelight event where it's a nighttime event, houses lit only by candlelight, um, mm -hmm. which is really fun. And I thought I'd sure. also bring in some pictures of specifically some of the Pennsylvania Dutch stuff that we do here. So we've got our Belschnickel. He comes <laughs> yeah, there he is. every year. <laughs> um, he, uh, you know, makes sure that the kids are behaving and oh, of course, yeah, gives them to. candy <laughs> if they are. Um, scares, <laughs> scares crap out of them if they aren't. <laughs> uh, this picture I think is from maybe the last year. So it doesn't show you. He's got antlers now. Uh, okay. He adds something new to the costume every year. Um, and then we've got some pictures of some of the, the craft projects that the kids have done with us here that are, you know, Pennsylvania Dutch inspired. Uh -huh. And then I figured while I'm here, might as well promote a couple of our events coming up. Coming up. Yeah, um, absolutely. So our next event is actually this Saturday at 1 p.m. We are having Matt and Melissa Dunphy of the Bog House podcast and blog uh, coming to the farmstead. They um, there are a couple who bought this old magic theater in Philadelphia in 2015, I think. And while they were you know restoring it, found two 18th century privies in the oh my God, yeah. basement and then have since become like these kind of amateur archaeologists and found thousands of really cool artifacts in there. Um, so that's going to be a really fun time. Uh, and then August 6th, we are having a concert from the Arts International Concerto Soloists at five. Um, they'll be playing, you know, all kinds of like classic hits and things like that. Well, that's awesome. Well, I, I, I will definitely link uh, your website, of course, uh, in the yes. show notes for anybody to learn more. Uh, and I know that you guys are also very active on social media, uh, Facebook yes. and Instagram. Uh, whoever's doing that work, I think, does a great job. I follow and like almost everything you guys do. It, it's always well, well done. Uh, and I just want to thank you for um, doing the work that you're doing and, and preserving this house. And I mean, it's 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 not far for a lot of us that live in Penn, you know in southeastern pennsylvania right going down to montgomery county is just around the corner for some of us so definitely a lot of things going on throughout the year so feel free to stop on down to the to the peter wentz farmstead and check it out and yeah. maybe get to meet carly when you're down there yes absolutely <laughs> please keep doing the the children's stuff in the summer that's so important and i'm yes. so glad that a lot i know a lot of historical places do that and i think it's so great that we yeah. can get these kids interested in this type of stuff because you never know you know, they might not enjoy it while they're doing it, but mm. a couple of years from now, they'd be like, oh, man, that one thing we did in the, in the summer was so awesome. Remember that? Yeah. And we, you know, so please keep doing that as, as someone that works with kids. Yeah. Every, you know, I, I know the importance of what you're doing. And of course, it's, it's just building for our future. So yeah. I want to thank you again, Carly, for coming on the show and sharing your story with us. And uh, hopefully we'll get some people out to the farmstead here in the in the very near future. And uh, hopefully we can work together again sometime in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Car uh, Carly, and please take care. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Yep. 
Well, leave a light. How about that? I think you all need to plan a trip to the Peter Wentz farmstead. It's not that far away. I want to throw back to someone as we were talking about the the paint uh, color schemes. Jeff says, okay, duck, try convincing your wife to decorate in that style. It's Pennsylvania Dutch. Actually, I think my wife would probably go for that, uh, Jeff, since she also, she's an art teacher um, and she's not afraid to, to, live a little bit when it comes to that type of stuff. Although I grew up in an old farmstead. It wasn't a 1700s era farm. So it was an 1800 era farmstead. Um, but we never had any polka dots on the wall in, in the maiden Ford farm. At least if they were, they were painted over by the time I was, I was running around as a kid. But Carly, what a great job that they're doing there at the Peter Wentz Farmstead. It's an awesome place. Please check them out on social media. Visit their website. Like I said, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes down below. Um, but we have a couple other things to do here before we leave. Every month, I bring a little bit of Pennsylvania Dutch language stuff. You got to see a little bit of German language stuff in Carly's presentation. That's great. Um, but every every month, I try to bring you something language-wise. So this month, of course, it is July. Uh, and I decided I went into my archives and found a poem that deals with July, particularly the most important holiday in July, minus my birthday, of course, the 12th, but we'll go with the 4th of July being more important than my birthday. And here is a poem by Louise Weitzel. I've featured her poetry before. Um, she lived from 1862 to 1934. Here is a part of her poem called Da Fiat July, the 4th of July. I got the Pennsylvania Dutch, of course, on the left. I'll be reading that. You can follow along if you don't understand Pennsylvania Dutch with the English on the right. Here we go, my dear friends. My Bibli gleich da fiat chalai, a main a is so she, a hot an ark for Laura, and finger un in bay. Ja, er will wieder schieße, wann da fiat kommt wieder rum. Sei hand is ganz vergribbelt, doch geb da gar nix drum. My Bibli gleich da fiat chalai, kann schier net water bis, a wieder bei kommt unser weg, was von ihm iberich is. <laughs> I love that poem. I just think it's so great. I get this image of this guy. Man, you know, there were tons of memes there around the 4th of July. Like I, the one that I saw a lot was like somebody is going to bed tonight with their right hand for the last time or something like that, like on July 3rd or something. So I just uh, throw it back. So back uh, when uh, Louise Weitzel was living, I guess people were not afraid to shoot off fireworks back then either. And there were people that uh, paid the price for it in some cases. What a great poem. Every month, I also like to bring you something musical. Uh, and if you were able to make the Kutztown Folk Festival and you got to see any of the music, you know that there is some awesome music that is always performed at the festival for the whole run of the festival. Uh, and I figured, let's hide highlight something from the festival. Now, this isn't a video from this year's festival. However, it's from the 2019 Kutztown Folk Festival, the last year before COVID shut it down. And it does feature one of our good friends of the channel and of the show, Keith Brinsenhoff. Uh, he still performs and is a is a performer yet, I guess I should say. Uh, and this is one of his songs. I'm gonna have to share my screen real quick. Give me one second, guys, to pull up this song. And I'll make it full... So this is his song performing at the 2019 uh, Kutztown Folk Festival with the Martin family, who's another family that performs all the time at the festival. Uh, and this is the song, Sie kommt rum de Barich, which translates into She's Coming Around the Mountain. So here, let's take a listen to this. Enjoy, everybody. Yeah, 
Well, there you go, dear people. Our good friend Keith Brinsenhoff. You can check him out every year at the Kutztown Folk Festival. Uh, and that's the song, of course, she's coming around the mountain. You probably, if you're American, you're familiar with that tune. If you're listening from Germany, maybe you've heard that tune before, but it's from the Pennsylvania Dutch perspective. And uh, that's always fun, too, right? That is always fun, too. Well, dear friends, what else do we have coming up? Uh, we had our music, we had our poem, we had our presentation, told you about news. Let's just hit a couple things here before we get out. As most of you know, we have our Zazzle shop, Rachel Yoder and I, where we have Pennsylvania Dutch themed merchandise for sale. Two brand new designs dropped today. We've been asked multiple times specifically for this one uh, design. We finally got it together and said, let's get this ready for the July episode. So here it is. We got the famous Kanstu Mikafanga. Can you catch flies? Yes, when they sit still. That's the design there. We got the fly on the front. And when they, stay, when they stay still on the back, you can order that. You can get it in any color t-shirt. You don't have to get it in the white here. We're just showing it in the white. But again, with our Zazzle shop, you don't have to get a t-shirt. You can order our stuff on sweatshirts, on magnets, on flags on stickers you just go to the website and you'll be able to pick the design you want and then there's all these different options the other one that dropped today is the one there on the right we we took an idea from uh, a certain soda brand here in southeastern pennsylvania pa dutch nix bessa and if you don't understand pennsylvania dutch, it's pretty much saying pennsylvania dutch nothing better than that nix bessa and again you can get that in a t-shirt form and in that color but you can also get other different color shirts uh but many other things so please check out the zazzle shop for your own pa dutch stuff of course we've i got my i'll stand up real quick i got my donavera t-shirt on tonight for the show and uh, but we have tons of other stuff as you can see there we got the ich bin Deutsch and the mock scoot and like i said i've gotten a bunch of these things on magnets that i have on my refrigerator you could stick them on a car or any anywhere uh with all different things there so check out the website of course if you're interested in purchasing something it is zazzle.com backslash pa dutch stuff like i said it's not just t-shirts and sweatshirts it's a lot of other things but all from our designs and you know we're not doing this to make a lot of money because we don't make a lot of money off we're doing it so that you guys can show off your pa dutch pride and get this stuff out there when i was walking around the kutztown folk festival i saw multiple people with with our stuff on and it really made me happy because a lot of them would come to me and say, check out my cool shirt, Doug. And I'm like, that is a great shirt. Thanks so much for, you know, buying it. And they said, this shirt gets me so many comments when I'm out in public. I'm like, that's great. So if you're interested, check out the website, of course. It's like, you don't have to get a shirt. There's many other options. Also, if you like what we're doing and you'd like to support us financially here at the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com backslash Doug Mainford. All money donated goes towards the upkeep of the channel, uh, new gear. Uh, one of the things a couple la a couple months ago, I was announcing that I was we were raising money to get some new cameras and wireless microphones. Well, through your generous donations, we were able to go out and purchase that stuff. And, and that's the stuff that I was using when we were filming at the Folk Festival this summer. So if you follow the channel, those new videos are going to be dropping here over the next couple of weeks that was all filmed with our brand new camera and our brand new wireless microphone system so thank you to a, a lot of people that donated particularly in the last couple of weeks i'd like to give a shout out to seth moak alan moyer the dryer family betsy Lobb, eric siebert chris arnold and todd santi thank you so much for your financial contributions um we do not take it lightly when anyone gives us money. We use that money for good things, of course. You don't have to support us financially, but if you like what we're doing here and you'd like to give us a boost, please feel free. Again, you can do that at buymeacoffee.com backslash Doug Maidenford. Mark your calendars, dear friends. Next month, almost one month from today, on August 23rd, that's a Wednesday again at 6 p.m., 
We'll have our August edition of PA Dutch Live, and I will be welcoming on Edward Johnson. Edward Johnson works for the Goshen Hoppen Historians. I announced their big event coming up here in August. He will be uh, joining us next month to tell us who are the Goshen Hoppens? What do they do? Who's this Henry Antis, and what was his plantation? What was that all about? So another history-based episode. I love those. Those are my personal favorites. And we're looking forward. I'm really looking forward for Ed to be on the show and to tell us the story of the Goshen Hoppens. It's going to be a great show. Mark your calendars. Wednesday. Day, August 23rd, dear friends. I hope that you had fun tonight. Um, I know I did. Carly was a great guest. We learned, I learned a lot. Uh, I could have talked to her a lot longer. I had a couple questions for her that I'll have to I'll have to eat her write her an email. Um, but you can find her email on their website if you had an, you know, if you thought of a question afterwards, whatever you'd like to know more about. Of course, just shoot her an email. Again, follow the Peter Wentz Farmstead on their social media stuff. I'll have a link to their website on the show notes down below once the recording is done. But dear friends, till next month, please. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Stay cool to the best of your ability, especially our friends joining us from Texas and Arizona. Good luck, guys. Good click, as we say in Pennsylvania Dutch. And until next week, or not till next week, till next month, dear friends, keep practicing your Pennsylvania Dutch. Go, go out and tell people about the good things we're doing here at the channel. And as we always say, Mox Goot. Mox Goot, so dear. Mox Goot, so Mach's gut zu dir for now. Unsere Zeit ist all und so es ist Mach's gut for now. Hoff wieder mit dir zu sein. Hoff du bringst her again Freund. Mach's gut zu dir, Mach's gut zu dir, Mach's gut zu dir for now. Unsere Zeit ist all und so es ist Max gut for now. Hoff wieder mit dir zu sein. Hoff du bringst her again Freund. Und so Max gut. Max gut. Lieber Freund. Max gut.